Number 10, working in general. I know. World War I, 1914 to 1918. If you didn't guess already, this wasn't the age of women, or at least treating them right. Just wasn't. This, however, was the beginning of things changing. The war had a lot to do with that. When men went off to war, women had to fill their shoes in places of work. When in reality, a few years prior to that, a woman working was a ridiculous idea. But what's a gal gonna do when she's got no choice? Knuckle up, buckle down, and do it, do it, do it. It might seem silly today to even mention women going to work, but this is good history. In the beginning of women's suffrage, really the middle of it. Number nine, this one's really cool, I like this one, this one's crazy. The Radium Girls. Yes, the radium girls. This is just a crazy story. So, this material called radium was discovered and its glowing properties were quickly put to work for military application. You'll find a lot of times that military service often boosts technology development. Just how it goes. So when a factory that was producing glow-in-the-dark watches for the war effort needed workers, they looked to women to stand up to the challenge. Day in, day out, these women painted with radium paint. The women were advised to keep the brushes with a fine tip by placing it between their lips. Kind of just a little lick, a little, a little kiss kind of, kind of cute. Some women even used it on their nails and others painted on each other. The novelty of glow in the dark paint quickly wore off, however, when it proved to be very harmful to one's health, especially since the women had been ingesting the harmful paint. In the end, it was radiation sickness. One woman had it so bad her jaw simply fell off. That's not it. I saw the picture, bro. It's, it's, it's just gone. It's uh, uh. Number eight, the Canary Girls. A very similar story to the previous, but perhaps one you may be unfamiliar with. The Canary Girls sing a familiar tune to that of the Radium Girls, except it wasn't radioactive, but rather just TNT. How could TNT be harmful besides when it blows up, right? That's what I thought. The only trouble I've seen with TNT is when Wile E. Coyote accidentally blows himself up trying to get the Roadrunner. That's where I get all my scientific knowledge from. I'm a scientist, what can you say? Well, besides cartoon antics, TNT was quite harmful due to the chemicals that made it up. So harmful, it would make the women sick. It would turn their skin orange and hair yellow, like a big bird yellow. Yeah, that yellow. It even sadly affected children born whose mothers had been exposed to the chemicals. Canary babies, as they were so called. This is why we have work safety rules. And ladies, next time there's a global conflict, check what's in the factory first before they throw you in there. You don't want to catch any of that, that's bad for you. Number seven, ambulance driver. Chauffeurs and drivers were a man's job when cars began to take over the roads. You gotta imagine this is a time when cars are still really new. However, why use a man there when we could use him in the trenches? Many women were trained and drove ambulances from the battlefield staging area back to a safer, safer area where doctors and nurses await your arrival. The pay wasn't great, there was lots of screaming, and a slight chance of getting shelled by German artillery. There's a part of me that always gets nervous while watching footage of this time period. Like the cars just look kind of flimsy, right? And they look like they could fall apart at any minute. And driving through the mud and the blood, top speeds only are going to be around 20 to 30 miles per hour tops. Cars get like 40 horsepower at most, which in case you didn't know is very slow. Usain Bolt on his best day runs twice that speed. I don't know, but you, I, I hope you, you ever see that footage and the cars are so like, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't look like they're gonna make it up the hill. It's weird. Number six, nurse. I know, I know. Yes, lots of ladies were, are, and going to be nurses. That's nothing new. And any nurse out there in the medical profession, thank you for your service. Chetty thanks you. Now, I don't need to tell anyone in the medical profession how busy a hospital floor can be on a bad night. Nurses running around, paging doctors, phones ringing, papers flying, something about a code blue. Hectic, right? Well, imagine that, but less equipment. A hundred years less technology, and all whilst under the suppression and threat of bombardment. Great. Yeah, not so fun, right? Sure, any nurse has comfy sketchers to take her to the graveyard shift, but no nurse has blast-proof equipment to treat people in a graveyard, as this is a field hospital and this is the best they can do for the time being. Yeah, see, that's not fun. That's kind of un it is, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Number five, ladies of the trench. This makes sense. A lot of sense, really. And as weird and crazy as it might sound, it might have made the men feel a little bit better. Trench life was awful. Refer to my World War I videos here. They're pretty good, I promise. Mud, blood, rats, disease, sickness, machine guns, barbed wire, no man's land, chemical warfare, and sadly, when all that was done and gone, brutal, borderline, medieval hand-to-hand -hand combat. That just must be terrible. I played Battlefield 1, that's fun, but in real life, that's just not fun. So when soldiers were taken out of rotation for a little R&R, &R, they might be pleased to see a brothel on wheels. 
brothels. That's right. Or when visiting certain northern towns in France, a very legal brothel uh, houses, if you will. When Americans join the fight, of 1,000 men being treated in hospital, 190 were being treated for a brothel related sickness. Go get them, boys. Some men would even ask for ladies who were known to possess such qualities because they knew if they caught it, it meant 30 days in a bed and not in a trench. That's honestly such a big brain play, I can't even. Number four, widow. Might not be an official occupation, but it is an official title, and officially, it sucks. Imagine a world where it's difficult to get by, a world where a woman is a second class citizen. So when her husband, her brother, her father, and maybe even her son get drafted to fight Germany and don't make it back, well, it's, it's not fun. Some struggled to find work, others remarried, and some had no choice but to practice the time old tradition of the world's oldest profession, if you know what I mean. Tough times, man. Especially for the ladies, not cool. Number three, farmers. Gotta tend to those fields, partner. This is also a time where there is farm equipment, yes, but not as common as today. It would have been expensive and nowhere near the state of the art farm equipment that we have today. Milking machines, combines, tractors, you name it. In 1914, it's offspring. That's your farm equipment. That's how it works. Ever notice how farmhouses got lots of bedrooms? Well, if you can't afford to hire farmhands, then you make some. Except, however, the key issue with the last point as well as here is the men in your family getting sent to war. Not coming back for four years is a problem. Or in a worst case scenario, not coming back at all. I mean, I'm sure some came back, they just came back in boxes. Which means wives, women, sisters, and daughters had to roll up their sleeves and get to work. And I don't have to tell any farmer watching this how important their job is, or how difficult it can be. You gotta feed the folks after all. Gotta do what's right by me, Dutch. <laughs> I don't know how farming's western, but all right. Number two, dancer. Little bit of a stretch here, but hear me out. World War I ended in 1918. By 1920, the Allies' economies had picked up, but especially in America. This was a time of great success, as a wise man once said. The Roaring Twenties, while the war was over, many folks were still feeling the effects, especially in Europe. Germany wasn't doing too hot, and they're gonna come back for a sequel. It's not gonna be good. As the sale of alcohol was banned, underground clubs began to open. Speakeasies, you may have heard them from my 20s videos. Men, soldiers returning home, women and minorities of all backgrounds were hanging out in these places, which was very progressive and cool for the time. The ladies were becoming flappers, which were dancers, out of the factories and enjoying the luxuries of a healthy economy. And I'm sure some of it had to start in 1918 at least because they knew the end was coming. It had to. It just had to. Trust me, it makes sense. Number one, politicians. For the first time in a long time, women were becoming politicians. Not presidents or governors, but their voices were being heard in the political space regardless, which is huge. A one Miss Rankin was voted into the US House of Representatives in 1916. A woman's right advocate, all brought to you by women's suffrage. I don't have to tell you how unusual that really is for the time. Especially for the time. Unfortunately for these ladies, while there would be some great step forwards like earning the right to vote and social progress in the 1920s, things would go back a few steps during the 40s and the 50s and wouldn't see massive resurgence until the late 60s and 70s. You gotta remember the good stuff though, even if it's baby steps. Number 10, Romanov eggs. The Romanov dynasty ruled over the empire of Russia for 300 years. 300 years of breakfast being served in the winter palace. And 300 years of ignoring the peasants even after they make an attempt on your life. Pfft, <laughs> peasants. Well, eventually this caught up with the royal family and the people and the workers revolted. They were pretty upset. It was Soviet time. Nicholas II was forced to abdicate his throne and power and went into exile with his family. Now, since the old government was out and, uh, well, it was time to let in the new one, huh? huh? That's a bad joke. Some resources were allocated to the new governing body. Makes sense. And perhaps maybe some family treasures also may have gone missing. I'm not sure. We told it and take. Communists would never take money. What? Well, the Romanov Fabergé eggs, for instance. Jewel and gold encrusted decorative eggs, the same that are probably in Nona's basement. However, these would have been worth a fortune. It's too bad they're missing. What a shame. We'll never know. Beautiful, just beautiful egg. Gold and jewels, ah, oh, fabulous. Number nine, Ark of the Covenant. It belongs in a museum. 
And if you see Indiana Jones in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, then you know it's chilling in a top secret military storage unit. Besides the whole atomic fridge scene, I actually think that movie's okay. I, do, I really do. The, the monkey swinging thing's a little weird with uh, Shia LaBeouf, but I, don't know, I, think, I, I think it's okay. Well, in Raiders, Indy is after the Ark of the Covenant, or at least he tries to go after the Ark of the Covenant and put it in a museum. <laughs> so stupid. The Germans kind of get there first, and even without Indy to save the day, the Germans, well, they botch it. I know that if you watched that scene when you were younger, it gave you nightmares. Don't lie, I know it did. Well, to put it simply, the Ark is a shiny gold box that may or may not contain what's left of the Ten Commandments. That's right, the same ones that Moses walked down the mountain, Charlton Heston, and these are the commandments of God. You know, you don't want to talk. You've seen the movie. It's a long movie, four hours. However, it's only meant for the eyes of those who are worthy, because if not, 80s CGI ghosts will come out and melt your face. Like in the movie. Number 8. Montezuma's Treasure The Aztecs were an amazing civilization in Mesoamerica who built grand cities with canals and boats for travel. Pretty smart all considering they never invented the wheel. It's kind of weird. They, they never did. It's strange. They also happened to fancy a bit of treasure and by that I mean they loved gold. The smell of it. The texture of it. The taste of it. I love gold. <laughs> Awesome powers, anyone? Chris liked it. He liked that part. Everything was great until the Spanish showed up and introduced blam blams, germs, and steel, as the Europeans do. The Spanish were after the Aztec treasure, and truth be told, they got a fair share of it too. However, King Montezuma had his own wealth, and it's said to be a fortune, which means he's the king. He's probably got a lot of gold. It makes sense. However, during an attack on the capital city, he was delifed, and his treasure buried somewhere that's never been found. Ooh, boy, you'd find a lot of good stuff in that pile. However, it may also be cursed, so I wouldn't exactly want to go looking. You'd end up with traveler's diarrhea or something. Montezuma's revenge, baby. Ooh. Number seven, German gold. 1940s Germany. They went on a world tour and they came out pretty strong, honestly. Pretty, pretty strong. However, after the international community decided that goose stepping home from the coffee shop wasn't ideal, they sent Germany packing. However, during their rise to power, Germany was allocating resources for their future trips. Part of this was stealing gold, treasure, and art, and pretty much anything of value, and bringing it back home to fund the war effort from pretty much anyone they could get their hands on. Ugh. So, after the war ended, all stolen loot was given back to the rightful owners, right? <laughs> of course it was. No, no it wasn't, because this is real life. While some was recovered, many accounted items are still unaccounted for. It's, it's way too much to even talk about, honestly, it's crazy. And for some, some of the stuff may also be sitting in a Swiss bank vault still. So, hmm, that's kind of shady. Swiss bank, uh-oh. Number 6. Mosby's Treasure A Confederate colonel found himself in possession of gold, silver, and valuable family heirlooms. Totally didn't rob all the people in the area to get that though. What? what, what no. Well, while transporting is totally not ill-gotten gains, it was rumored that a Union patrol was nearby. In fear of being caught and slowed down by all of his loot, Colonel Mosby decided to bury his treasure between two pine trees, marked with his knife. That's how you know. You know it's always going to be there. After falling back to Confederate lines, he sent out a patrol to retrieve it. The patrol got got by Union soldiers, and Mosby never returned. So anyone near Fairfax, Virginia, you may be standing on top of a lot of Civil War treasure. Number 5. Hojo Masamune Master sword maker and legendary smith, his sword was passed down through through generations. The craftsmanship, the history, and the fact that katanas are just cool. Ask anyone at Anime North, they'll tell you, they're, they're all very cool. Well, it was still around in the 1940s, however, while the international community was explaining to Germany how big of a mistake they made, America was giving Japan a spank on the bum bum. After 1945, America had occupied Japan as it is normal to do after a war. However, that meant the Japanese forces and civilians had to be disarmed. It was kind of a touchy subject and kind of a tough time, but it had to be done. That means no blam blams and no ceremonial poking sticks. The issue is America wasn't keeping these, I mean they did keep some, but they were more so destroying things and it is speculated that in the confusion that was post World War II Japan, the legendary sword was destroyed, thus lost forever. Number 4. Blackbeard's Treasure the most ruthless pirate of the seven seas and the Queen Anne's Revenger were eventually defeated in battle. Before he met his fate, old Blackbeard said he buried all of his riches. 
That was enough to inspire many to look for his booty. One can only imagine what he has buried. Gold, jewels, silver. I mean, the possibilities with Blackbeard are endless. He, he, he was everywhere. It could be all kinds of amazing stuff there. It's, Kind of overwhelming to think about. I should go on a treasure hunt. However, it's kind of like that last scene in Breaking Bad. Jack was gonna tell Walt where his money is, but Heisenberg, Heisenberg didn't care and ended it. Sometimes ending the reign of an evil man is more important than taking his riches. That's why they, they got rid of Blackbeard. He's not around no more. Number three, Libertalia. Uncharted fans, rejoice. So it's the early to mid 1700s and you're a pirate in the golden age of piracy. Ooh, nice. The Caribbean was a hotbed for your misdeeds. However, sometimes it wasn't so easy to dodge the crown on the seas and getting caught would mean, well, you'd probably lose your life. It wouldn't be good. So what did a bunch of pirates led by Captain Jane's mission do? They made their own colony in Madagascar because you can't boss us around if we were the bosses. Mm, smart. It was called Libertalia. So imagine, if you will, a whole city full of the nastiest, most violent criminals of the seven seas. Can you imagine what those bars were like? Sadly, however, this may or may not have been true. We're, we're not exactly sure. It sounds like it might not have been true, just made up. But cool if it was, though, and then, then it'd be lost of time as we we'll find it. Number two, feature presentation. As an actor, I find this one pretty cool. The story of the Kelly Gang was released in Australia in 1906 and is regarded as the first feature length film. With the runtime of over an hour, the movie depicts the story of an old outlaw gang. At the time, the film was doing great and opened in New Zealand as well as England. Pretty cool for the time. Sadly, though, for fans of vintage film, uh, which includes me. Check out Freaks 1932, it's one of my favorites, great movie. But like I said, sadly the film was lost and or partially destroyed, meaning the only thing we have left is a few segments of the movie. We've done our best to uh, refurbish the film, but it's been lost to time. Number one, Atlantis of the Sands. Atlantis of the Sands refers to a legendary lost city in the southern deserts of the Arabian Peninsula, thought to have been destroyed by a natural disaster or as a punishment by God. Known as Ubar, Wabar, or Iram. In 1992, excavations in the area did reveal some sort of city was present many years ago. However, there's not much to be found and many theories have sparked up. This could be a lost city that's mentioned in Islamic holy books and maps. However, some may say the remains of the stone structures that are there are of that of a much later simple fortress, or others think it doesn't even exist at all. So, you can go figure, but otherwise, it's lost. I found it in Uncharted with Nathan Drake. We, we, we found it, but you know, everyone else, they, they, they didn't find it, that, but that's okay. Number 10, the Swiss Last Stand. Guys, this list taught me a lot of things, but one thing stands out above the rest. We are so freaking soft, like so damn soft. I have never, nor will I probably, who knows, ever face certain death willingly, like these people did. Lutheran mercenaries on May 6th, 1527 were pillaging across northern Italy and finally they made it to Rome. They made straight for Vatican Hill and Pope Clement VII was on the hit list. While he was being smuggled out of Rome, 189 Swiss guards stood up against 20,000 bloodthirsty and angry troops. They formed a fighting square and based on numbers alone, what should have been a quick victory turned into an all day battle. The Swiss troops managed to beat back wave after wave of troops. When their swords dulled, they fought with daggers. When the daggers got lost, they fought with fists and teeth. It just went on and on. Sadly, they were taken down to the very last man, but their perseverance and courage still stand against the test of time. Number nine, the Battle of Hastings. Winding the clocks back to 1066 to the Battle of Hastings, this one went down in East Sussex, England, and it happened in the middle of October, so why not include this one in the list? This battle was fought between the Norman French army of William, Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the command of King Harold Godwinson. This kicked off the Norman conquest of England. According to William the Conqueror, the previous king of England, Edward the Confessor, originally promised the crown to William. You promised him the crown, but right before he passed away, the guy was on his deathbed and he literally changed his mind. How rude. Instead, he passed the crown onto Harold Godwinson. So William, yeah, he was he was a tad upset at this point. So he and his forces defeated Godwinson, went right into London, and became England's first Norman king. Epic. Number eight, Vimy Ridge. I learned about this in school and my history teacher was so excited to tell me about it and I'm still excited about it today. This battle is the reason Canadian soldiers earned their notoriety during World War I. The Battle of Vimy Ridge remains a testament to 
expert organization and strategy. From April 9th to 12th in 1917, four divisions of the Canadian Corps captured Vimy Ridge from the Germans, making the largest territorial advance made by any Allied force in the war. The losses were significant, resulting in 10,000 men either killed or wounded, so it wasn't the easiest win. However, through their meticulous planning and secret operations, they were able to break the stalemate between the Allied and enemy forces. Soldiers before they were sent over actually trained on a replica of Vimy Ridge, so they were like well rehearsed when they showed up. They knew Vimy Ridge like the back of their hand. Meanwhile, at Vimy Ridge, 11 tunnels were constructed in secret to bring the first wave out safely in front of German lines. Each tunnel was also equipped with lighting, water supplies, and first aid. Behind front lines, the soldiers moved in well rehearsed timed attacks based on where Allied and enemy trenches were marked. Vimy Ridge marked a change in military tactic and highlighted the heroic nature of Canadian soldiers. Yeah, Vimy Ridge is kind of like a big deal over here. It's kind of cool. It wasn't just Canadians, they were like British soldiers too. But, you know, take it where you can get it. Number seven, the Siege of Orleans. 1429, this battle marked the first major military victory for the French Royal Army following their defeat 30 years prior at the Battle of Agincourt. The Siege of Orleans is noted mostly for the involvement of Joan of Arc. This was during the late stages of the Hundred Year War between England and France. For about six months, the English was winning, but nine days after Joan of Arc's arrival, the siege collapsed. Joan of Arc was just 17 years old also during this battle. But even before this, when she was just 12 or 13, she started to hear voices is apparently from God. She saw these visions as well, and during her trial, she testified that saints and angels told her to go to church, to live a good life, and to also establish Charles VII to the French throne and be the country's rightful king. Not a bad tip off from the God Squad. Now, while she did command the army at a young age, Joan of Arc didn't actually participate in combat. She did outline strategies and inspire troops, and also she was famous for her temper. That's pretty epic. Number six, the Winter War. The Winter War during World War II is not spoken of often, despite it being kind of incredible. Stalin was looking to expand his territory and had long wanted a reason to take over Finland. And so they invaded. Vastly outnumbered and outgunned, Finland should have fallen, but they didn't. One reason is that they were fighting on their turf, and two, a man named Simo Heha. Marshal Carl Gustav Mannerheim created a complex network of concrete bunkers, trenches, and fortifications that discouraged tank attacks by the Russians. The Finnish also used their skis to take out men through like lightning fast hit and run attacks. But Simo Moheha made the Soviets shake in their boots. He was credited for over 500 kills within 100 days, despite being a humble farmer. He became known as the White Death and was one of the reasons that in just three months, Russia suffered 300,000 casualties while Finland sat at 65,000. Wow. Number five, the Battle of Marathon. Every New Year's Eve, there's always a guy on Facebook who just becomes a runner all of a sudden. They have the squirt water belt, the whole thing. They train for a marathon. But what is a marathon? Was it a person? Is it just a name for 42 kilometers? Well, it was a battle back in 490 BC between ancient Greeks and Persian invaders sent by King Darius. The Persians arrived to Marathon, about 20,000 of them. They arrived to punish the Greeks for supporting the Lanians who revolted against the Persians. The Greeks were outnumbered greatly, but they attacked hard and fast, and they took out 6,000 Persians, and eventually they just fled entirely. The number of Greek fighters lost was only around 200, so far less casualties. The story of Phidippides came to be at this time. He ran the first ever marathon. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to deliver messages. BBM wasn't a thing back then, so he just had to blow his kneecaps out six times a day. He was one of the Greek military men known as the day-long runners. He did six marathons back to back, basically. Meanwhile, my uncle on Facebook Books like hashtag runner life. <laughs> okay, no, next. Delete, delete. Number four, the Battle of Waterloo. Fun fact in grade 10, my classmate and I reenacted the Napoleonic Wars with breakfast sandwiches that we made and brought to class. We got an A. Anyways, the Napoleonic Wars lasted between 1803 to 1815 and led to the deaths of over 5 million people. But after only 9 hours of bloodshed next to the Belgian town of Waterloo, the world changed forever. This moment in history marked the end of Napoleon's attempt at conquering Europe. On June 18th, 1815, Allied forces composed of British, Dutch, Belgian, and German thwarted Napoleon's attack. Thanks to them, Napoleon was left singing, Waterloo, I was defeated and you won the war. 
ABBA. It paved the way for the powers today, lending a pathway for the British to become a global power, good and bad. Demand for American war supplies was crucial during the Napoleonic Wars as they remained neutral. Britain somewhat got in the way of the trading, but the Europeans' need for American cotton and grain became a higher importance, therefore establishing America as like a power. Now there was a lot of bloodshed behind the scenes here as we know from colonialism in general, though it is clear that this battle changed the course of history for more good and bad to arise. We have to include one of the most important battles of World War II on this list. We've seen this one on screen now numerous times. Every time I watch Saving Private Ryan, I don't breathe for that entire beach sequence. It's I couldn't even imagine what that must have been like in real life. Beginning on June 6, 1944, 156,000 American, Canadian, and British troops arrived at five beaches along the coast of France's Normandy region. Before the invasion, the Allied forces made this large-scale campaign, a deceptive one in order to mislead the Germans. Come August, most of northern France was liberated, and not long after the Germans were defeated. Historians refer to this battle as the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. The late Ray Lambert, who recently passed in April at age 100, was an army medic during D-Day. His unit was sent to Normandy that June, and Ray Lambert saved 15 lives that day, despite having a broken back himself. He would drag injured men from the water to the secure small area behind this concrete block. He was 23 during D-Day as well, I'll save you the math. At the 75th anniversary ceremony of D-Day, that same block was named Ray's Rock and has a plaque on it honoring Lambert and his men. Number two, 300. Yeah, it was real. If you've seen the movie and the abundance of rippling pectorals, then you have heard of 300. But no, it wasn't just a movie, it happened, but the 300 was actually more like 4,000. But still, when you put it side by side to the massive hordes of enemies they faced, it might as well be 300. The Battle of 300 refers to the actual Battle of Thermopylae. King Leonidas was raised as roughly and brutally as depicted in the film, perhaps even harsher. So when horsemen from the east appeared in 481 BC as messengers from the god king Xerxes of Persia, he knew what he was to face. They demanded land and water, aka obedience to the empire. But instead of just Spartans, Athens and Sparta decided to form an alliance. It was suggested that they block the narrow passage, the hot gates, of the Thermopylae coast. The Spartans and Greeks faced over 150,000 Persian soldiers, and despite fierce fighting, they did lose. However, the battle remains one of the most famous in Greek history, not because they lost, but because of the testament of courage that stood against thousands. And coming in at number one, the Battle of Yorktown. Well, the surrender at Yorktown, rather. On this day, October 19, 1781, the Americans defeated the British at Yorktown, Virginia. British General Lord Cornwallis had to surrender about 8,000 soldiers, bringing an end to the American Revolution. Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, famously killed in a duel with Aaron Burr. If you have Disney+, Plus, go watch the musical Hamilton, because you'll be dancing your way through history lessons in no time. According to historian and author of Alexander Hamilton, the formative years, Hamilton had a genius and was working hard, but did not come from an illustrious family like most of the founding fathers. He knew that winning glory in battle would make him famous and therefore help him further his career. Seriously, if you haven't seen Hamilton, I implore you to dive in tonight. It is the anniversary. What else do you have going on? Let's do it. Number 10, a 10 hut. The Roman army, baby. It's rough, it's tough. And worst of all, to their enemies, they were organized. But something every Roman soldier had to go through was some intense training. The training lasted four months, that's too long, started with intense marching and eventually moved into sparring. By the time they were finished, they were able to march 20 miles in full armor. A paid military rank and highly effective, the Romans were a formidable fighting force and an inspiration to many, including some ideas that are used in modern militaries today. While not having a perfect win to loss ratio, the Romans are probably most remembered for their military prowess, techniques, and weaponry. They got some cool spears. The theme, or really their best tactics, was teamwork. Roman legions worked as one. It would make them a very worthy opponent for many opponents. Number 9, Lonely Romans. I don't know about you guys, but after conquering lands and marching for days, I would be tired. As much as the Romans hated barbarians, some of them were tough and cost the Romans many lives in battle. So it would be best for the Romans to fight their hardest in order to come home to their families. Well, that wasn't exactly the case for Romans as they were not allowed to be married. Not until the second century, that was. All that unaliving and conquering. And no one to come for you from all those horrors of war. I would need a hug for sure. However, like a lot of rules, they were meant to be broken as some higher ranking Romans in the military did take some wives. 
And honestly, can you blame them? Number eight, short straw. Roman soldiers were professionals, maybe too professional. In the time of the Romans, there was the occasional deserter, or mutiny. However, the Romans had a simple solution for this, or rather a pretty wild one. Something called decimation, or the removal of tents. Basically, after an offense has been committed, you and nine buddies line up to draw straws. Whoever draws the shortest straw gets unalived by your remaining nine friends, often by stoning, clubbing, or stabbing. That's just, that's just great. This punishment was not just limited to grunts, but open to any rank and anyone who dared disobey the Roman military code. Cause they're Romans and that's just how the Romans do. Forget about it. I spoke to the legionnaire of my army today, who just so happens to be the chief. And you know what he said? That's not it. Number seven, the Battle of Cannae. This was a hard day for many Romans. Maybe it was its overzealous confidence from conquering so much after losing so little. However, after facing the mighty elephant riding Hannibal of Carthage, the Romans were about to get a piece of their own medicine. Over 40,000 Romans would meet their ends in the Battle of Cannae. I can only imagine the confusion and humiliation the Romans must have felt. The battle is considered to be one of the worst days in Roman military history. It's also considered to be one of the greatest strategic military victories in history. From the bad guys, or the Carthage at least. I mean, they beat the Romans in the one thing they are really good at. That's like me trying to beat Michael Phelps in a swimming race, and then me winning. Yeah, never gonna happen. Which I'm sure if I did would shock absolutely everybody, including myself. I'm not built for swimming, I'm built for sinking. That's just how it goes. Number six, the Battle of Carthage. It wouldn't be a good story without a little revenge, would it? The Third Punic War was the last time Rome and Carthage would engage in combat. Rome began the siege of Carthage, and it was a brutal fight. Carthage did everything they could to repel the Romans, but Rome was powerful and was ready for their sweet revenge. Eventually, the city could no longer repel the Roman attack and was captured. The city was completely destroyed, and those who survived the siege were taken by the Romans and sold off into YouTube's least favorite S-word. The Romans had fought hard against Carthage and were probably glad to be rid of Hannibal and his war elephants. Yes, that's right, war elephants. He, he trained elephants to kill people. Like, that isn't so insane that you could train an elephant. Number five, civil unrest. Imagine you're a farmer, poor, hungry, and tired from tending fields all day long. Or you're a merchant in a city who's doing their best to get by. When you hear the thunderous marching of Roman soldiers approaching your position, the Romans are here to Romanify you. Or something like, there's no verb for that, I guess, I don't know. There's a good chance if you don't accept the Romans at your front door with open arms, they would force you to anyway. This means a lot of Roman soldiers dealt with civil unrest at home and abroad. And sometimes people just didn't want to be Roman. Kind of makes sense. Kind of a broad point too, but this is just how it goes when you conquer that much. The Roman Empire was one of the largest the world would ever see. Eventually, she would fall, due to many factors, but the civil unrest was always there. At least we still got the Colosseum though, right? Pretty cool. Number four, Wizards of the Barbarians. The spookiest enemy of the Romans, no doubt, was the Druids. Religious-like figures who aided the barbaric hordes in many different ways. Romans did not like them, and they wanted them gone. You could almost say they wanted to purge them. Like a certain hooded Sith that purged the galaxy of those treacherous Jedi. Execute Order 66. Unfortunately for the Druids, they got a bad rap, as almost everything we know about them is written by Romans, who were their enemies, and they weren't exactly that nice when speaking about them. So were they actually magical ritual practicing wizards? Maybe, but always remember that history is written by the victors. A lot of Romans are great because they told us they were. However, for the average Roman soldier at the time, any amount of propaganda about weird wizard people it was probably believed, as there's no trusted reliable sources of information back then, like Wikipedia to fact check, because they always have facts. Number three, barbarians. Barbarians are basically what all Romans called, well, basically non-Romans. Uncivilized, brutal peoples living outside of Rome in the lands that Romans so wanted to conquer. More specifically though, the Goths from Gaul. In what is now modern day France, many times the Romans would find themselves engaging with the people of Gaul. Conquest and assimilation is the name of the game. And like the other tribes and cultures in proximity to the Romans, they weren't exactly going to take it sitting down. Eventually the tides would turn in their favor and every Roman soldier's worst nightmare would come true. Rome was sacked by Gaul in 390 BCE. The horrors, 
Number 2 Attila the Hun Probably the most ruthless enemy the Roman Empire ever faced. Every once in a while someone rises in the ranks in history and becomes a well known conqueror. He ranks up there with the other big bad boys. Going against the Hun was to be a formidable foe. He conquered many lands before taking aim at the Roman Empire. I can just imagine the dread on the Roman soldiers faces when they realized who they were going to be toe to toe with. However, in the end the Romans would claim victory and Attila was defeated and perished during his attempted conquest. Number 1 Being a Soldier I mean let's be honest, through everything I've said the Roman army was made up of soldiers. Sure it may have been a very long time ago but it's, it's still the army. And I don't know how you guys feel about it but I am certainly not brave enough to be in the army. All my respect and love goes out to any soldier in the armed forces, thank you for your service, seriously. But being in a modern army may be tough, but imagine being in the Roman army. I mean you gotta walk everywhere or, or sail everywhere and you better hope the enemy is close cause otherwise you're gonna be walking or sailing for a long time. And as a tubby boy with asthma I would not fare well in the hot mediterranean sun. With excessive walking and a diet of wine and bread, trying to swing a sword while bloated must have been the biggest challenge yet. No thanks. I'll pass. Number 10 Queen of the Red Sails In history when men drop the ball there's always an iron willed woman to pick up the slack. Not because a man is telling her to but because she wants to. How about inheriting a whole pirate fleet from your late husband? Meet Zhang Yi Sao. Her husband had managed to build quite the little nautical empire and with his untimely passing she became the boss. She commanded a fleet of over 400 ships and estimated between 20 to 60,000 pirates at her peak. She's noted for organizing and uniting pirates into a confederation. She also had some imperial entanglements, having entered conflict with the East India Company and the Portuguese Empire. This is a lot to go through, especially when I get anxiety from being left alone at the cashier at the grocery store. Number 9 Double Trouble the Trung sisters from Vietnam are still celebrated today because honey they went through a lot. The sisters led the first resistance against Chinese dominance which at the time had lasted over 247 years. Many believe Vietnam wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for their efforts, gathering 80,000 people to join their cause, once killing a tiger and writing a proclamation of war on its hide. They managed to hold off the Chinese forces for 3 years before finally being overtaken. The Trunk sisters are a great deal of national pride and pride amongst many women in Vietnam. Sadly the Chinese proved too strong, but to prevent capture the sisters later drowned in a last fit of defiance. Number 8 Hell Hath No Fury The Roman Empire was just about good at everything. Politics, culture, building a city that would stand the test of time and eventually outlive their civilization. But perhaps the Romans strongest attribute was their military. I mean come on it's Rome, no introduction is needed here. So when a man was worried that the Romans he had worked with might take over his homeland after he had passed, he left a note in his will saying please do not take this, this is mine, don't take it. I'll give the folks at home a second to think about what the Romans did next. If you guessed annex his homeland and do non YouTube friendly conduct things to his wife and daughter you'd be correct. His wife Boudicca not feeling so cool about what happened took some action by gathering the tribe together and revolting against the Romans. Defeating the scrambled Romans in a battle she then made her way to Londinium or what's now London and had it burned. There were empires that couldn't take down the Roman Empire and Boudicca did it like it was nothing. They did end up losing and once again to avoid capture drank poison. But come on she took down the Romans. Number 7 Viva la Revolucion Juana de Padilla was born in Spanish controlled Peru to two loving parents. Like many classic stories her mother sadly passed away when she was young, where she grew very attached to her father. Although unusual for the time, her father instructed her on how to horse ride and sharpshoot, even helped her father work during the days. They were pretty tight, but like an M. Night Shyamalan movie there's a double twist. Her father passed away in her teens. Now an orphan she was forced to move in with her aunt where she quite possibly developed the very first feelings of teenage angst before there was ever an Avril Lavigne album. Juana would often have outbursts that got her eventually sent to become a nun, where that also did not go very well. During her studies she was fond of Joan of Arc but eventually she was expelled at a young age of 17. After years of witnessing colonial reign she joined the revolution. She became so passionate about the cause. She once fought a battle while pregnant, went back to have a baby, 
and then went back to battle with the baby strap to her back. Man, sometimes I don't even want to get up after a large meal. What a woman! Number 6. Not one step back. Ludmila Pavlchenko was just like any other girl in Russia in the 1940s. She was in her last year of university, when history's favorite mustache man invaded history's second favorite mustache man. Feeling inspired by her country's call to arms, she signed up for military service. She would eventually find her way to be a sharpshooter. During the siege of Odessa, she is credited with 187 confirmed kills. She married a fellow sniper, he died, then she went on to have over 300 confirmed kills when the war was over. Once the military realized how valuable she was, she was pulled from the front lines, where she became key propaganda for Russia. She would also find herself training young snipers up until the end of the war. She was oftentimes referred to as the Lady of Death. Number 5. The Limping Lady World War II was the cause and effect for a lot of things. If you like spies and espionage, it's kind of where it all started. One of the best spies who did more than her fair share was Virginia Hall. A lady with a peg leg who thwarted German plans again and again. With her sidekick and peg leg nickname Cuthbert. She was credited by top German officials as being the most dangerous spy of all time. In one OSS report, her team is credited with destroying four bridges, derailing a freight train, and neutralizing 150 enemies with hundreds more captured. Now, I'm not a world class detective or anything, but I feel like if you're trying to find the female spy with a peg leg, it isn't that hard, on account of, you know, some pretty specific identifying features. I don't know how you messed that up. Where is the lady? Where is her? And you like hear her walking down the hall, she got a peg leg. What do you mean? Number four, Miss General. Fu Hao was one of 60 wives to Emperor Wu Ding, which I'm not sure even Mormons can figure that out. But to avoid obscuring into the background like TV's least favorite sister wife, she took control. According to records, she led many successful military campaigns and commanded an army of 13,000. While stories of the past can get lost, this is most likely true as her tomb was full of many different weapons like great axes, which was common to bury distinguished generals with at the time. When I'm buried as a warrior princess, I want my collection of pop figures to come with me. I spent too much time on those bad boys to not take them with me to the afterlife. Number 3. Fatality Tamiris was the queen of Mazagate. Or at least I think that's how it's pronounced. A confederation of nomadic tribes that lived east of the Caspian Sea. She ruled during the 6th century BC and is most famous for her vengeful war she waged against the Persian king Cyrus the Great. At first, the war wasn't going too great. Unfortunately, her son claimed his life out of shame for losing in battle. Mom was not happy and promised the bloodiest battle ever. Well, she wasn't lying. As the promised battle was very bloody, many Persians perished in battle, including Cyrus. When his body was recovered, the vengeful queen harnessed the power of mid-90s fighting games and removed his head and turned his skull into a cup and proclaimed, drink your fill of blood. Nice. Number 2. The Beautiful Samurai What does it mean to be a samurai? Armor, a kick-ass sword, and a coat of honor? Yes, it does. And Tomoe Gozen did it all and had time to look good doing it. Tomoe Gozen's life is shrouded in mystery and many debate her existence, but whatever be the case, she did leave a mark on history. A very red stain mark on history. Earning the respect of the men around her, it was stated that she had long black hair and a fair complexion and was in command of a large number of men. However, her biggest claim to fame when she was approached by multiple foes, she rode right at them, grabbing their leader and liberating his head from his shoulders. Wow, you slay it, queen. Number one, who else could it go to but the Maid of Orleans? All the badass women who went through a lot on this list, they seen some stuff, honey. But Joan, Joan of Arc, girl, she takes the cake. Joan was born a poor peasant, but had a unique gift. She could speak to the gods, and the gods told her it was her time to shine. By the time she was 19, she had led thousands of men to battle and in glorious victory. Charles VII, losing the 100 Years' War at the time, said, All right, sure, send the girl to fight. What have we got to lose? Well, they actually had a lot to win. Once Joan had gotten involved, the French began to win victory after victory, and her claims of being guided by God didn't seem so far fetched after all. The British, being so shaken up by the young girl's military prowess, thought she had been possessed by the devil. The British, not liking losing war to a teenage girl, decided to treat her with compassion by keeping her warm with a fire while she was tied to a wooden post. 
Joan would later become a legend for her efforts because getting burned at the stake is honestly a lot and I can't even deal. During the Cold War. Number 10, the Cold War. Some of our viewers may have lived through the times classified as the Cold War, but let me clarify for anyone who doesn't know or was too deep into hippie culture to remember what the heck was going on. And honestly, it's pretty messed up. So in a nutshell, after World War II ended, Germany was split into two. One side, capitalist allies, the other, communist Soviet Union. Russia was an ally during World War II, but this relationship quickly deteriorated. The two political and economic ideologies would grow distaste for one another, and would compete politically, economically, and most fearfully, with their militaries. The United States being the superpower on the one side, and the Soviet Union on the other. They spread their views, a lot of times by force, until almost the entire world was divided by the two styles of government, lasting from 1945 all the way up until MTV was still good, around the mid-90s when the Soviet Union was dissolved. That's a lot of history to unpack here, so I'm gonna do my best to tell you some crazy facts and to make you laugh. I'm a comedian, it's what I do. Number nine, Charlie in the Trees. We've talked about Vietnam a few times on this channel, but I can't stress this enough. It was messed up for many people, Americans and Vietnamese alike. As a Canadian, we mostly dodged that hairy situation. While the Vietnam War was America's worst war since World War II, and the most costly in terms of lives and budget, it was not the only conflict. Vietnam was probably the hottest war of the Cold War, but there's many other little things that make this such an interesting time. France had spent years trying to reclaim their colony, and with no luck, America being there for a total legit reason of containment also didn't have much luck, especially after 1968. Refer to our Vietnamese war videos, they're pretty good. Lives lost, lessons learned, and hopefully somebody found Charlie. I swear, in every movie they're always looking for a guy named Charlie. I guess we never find him, I don't know. Number 8, the name's Bond, James Bond. It would be difficult to talk about the Cold War without talking about espionage and spies. While not to the exaggerated level the 007 series likes to take things with its, well, little people and lethal hat throwing, there was still however a ton of black ops going on behind the scenes. You only had to look at the superpower spy agencies, the CIA and the KGB. Both agencies went on globetrotting clandestine operations to gather information, sabotage, and just about anything else James Bond would do. Stealth, spy gadgets, and missions to save the world. All martini shaken, of course, not stirred. Just like Bond, except the whole womanizing thing. Or maybe there was, as the Soviets would often use women's alluring good looks to produce results they so wished for. Ah yes, thanks to beautiful female agents sleeping a lot, uh, thank you. We now know we are one step closer to discovering the Colonel's secret herbs and spices. Our chicken shall have flavor soon. Number 7, Fallout. Probably the heaviest underlying theme of the Cold War was the constant and looming threat of nuclear annihilation. The US got smart in the end of 1945 and developed and used the world's first atomic bombs. This was great for America, not so great for Japan. America was feeling mighty high. That was until the Soviet Union developed their own shortly after. Now it wasn't so cool anymore. Both sides were worried that further escalation of any issue in the Cold War would lead to mutually assured destruction, rendering the bombs the most destructive weapon on Earth and also the most useless. And to be fair, there was a good chance of that happening. There were multiple instances of escalation where the world watched on as the two superpowers were about to end it all. Finna act up because they wanted their politics to be number one. I'm an act up. Number six, space race. No, the space race is not a race on how many special brownies that you can eat and see how fast it takes you to space out. Remember grade 10, right? I know. What it actually was was a race to see who could develop the best and fastest space age technology and advancements, which if you study economics could be a good thing. Healthy competition driven by new technology. In reality, it kind of sucked though. In the 1950s, Russia launched the first satellite, the Sputnik. Which to America was scary because it's America, we never lost anything. The Soviet Union would follow up with the first animal in space and then the first man. Some experiments unfortunately never made it back in one piece. America then trumped them back by landing on the moon. Now what's so messed up? Well, for the Soviet Union, this began to put a severe dent in their economy. All the spending on space and military was having an effect on their people. In a nutshell, it made them broke. And if you want to figure out what style of government is better, well, the US has Las Vegas, Russia has beets, and turnips, and depressed artists. 
Number 5. The Korean War A war that is frankly just not talked about enough and sadly I feel like the veterans don't get enough praise so thank you. Now back to the mildly funny content. Korea was finding itself in quite a pickle. The same pickle that 40 other nations throughout the Cold War would find themselves in. Capitalism and communism were going to have a fight. A fight in their backyard. And it was going to be costly. Both sides supported their own not so nice dictator and a bloody conflict ensued. Despite the UN and US efforts and despite the Chinese and Soviet efforts, things kind of ended in the worst stalemate ever. As even today the tensions exist, Korea remains split in two by the ideologies. And North Korea is still a little crazy. Just a little bit. Number 4. Up Up and Away Back when history's second favorite mustache man, Sosef Jolin, was in charge, things were kind of oppressive. They were just really oppressive, actually. It, it, it was bad. Where were the Karens when we needed them to stand up to the actual oppression? When Germany was split into cool and not so cool Germany, the division between its citizens was becoming clear, and the people on the capitalist side were just living better, as life is better when you can walk into a German 7 Eleven and purchase a Slim Jim, cigarettes, Mountain Dew, and a reputable magazine with lewd centerfolds. You know the one. So Mustache Man feeling confident after getting rid of history's favorite Mustache Man blocked roads and trains from Berlin in hopes that the West would give in to his demands. And in pure teenage defiance, the West began to fly in supplies daily. 12,000 tons of goods daily. That's a lot of centerfolds, my guy. Number 3. The Man Who Saved the World Vasily Arkhipov, not a name I reckon my humble bumblebees are familiar with. Well, why is this man so important? He's one of the reasons why you're not watching this video from the comfort of a concrete bunker. During the totally non-controversial Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a Russian submarine with a Russian submarine commander. All of Sean Connery jokes aside, the sub had nuclear capabilities. What's even scarier than that is due to some rising tensions and miscommunication, the bane of every good relationship, three out of four keys had been turned and were waiting on Vasily's response. Those were keys to launch nukes by the way. Maybe it was his bleeding Russian heart, or a strong will to save mankind. Or it could have been nuclear radiation warping his brain and body due to a previous mishap on the sub. But regardless, he said nay, and the nuclear war was avoided. Thank goodness. I hope that never happens again. Whew. Number 2. Broken Arrow What is scarier than the uncertain destruction of society as we know it? And trust me, nuclear fire would be a bad way to go. I don't want to grow another third arm. The first one was difficult to get rid of. Well, how about not knowing at all where the bombs are? Sure, you wouldn't really see one until there was a mushroom cloud over your favorite vegan restaurant, and by then it would just be too late. But what I'm talking about is devices that got lost in the mail or just lost by the military. And yes, it's happened multiple times through the decades. One incident where a device was lost from a crash plane and three out of the four safeties had been failed. That's a little too close for comfort. But of the declassified incidents the US is willing to tell you about, the Soviet Union has never said how many they lost. Just one of those comforting facts to keep both sides of your pillow warm at night. Number 1. Happy Ending There were tons of things to talk about during the Cold War. Seriously, you need a historian and a few textbooks to break everything down. However, when you boil down the main events, what was it really for? All that tension and stress. Nuclear war is just on the horizon. Years of arms racing and flinging people into the atmosphere faster than you can say, look out Ukraine. A lot of things changed and a lot didn't. To me, it just seems like it's such a waste of money and time to have all those world enders collecting dust somewhere under an onion shaped building. Russia has some onion shaped buildings. I, I'm just assuming that's, that's where they are. I'm hungry at this point. The point I'm making is let's keep the nuking to the fat man and fall out the video game. Not real life. Let's just be peaceful. Number 10 Third party involvement. You'd be forgiven if you thought the Vietnam War was a really bad war between the United States and Vietnam. Literally every book, movie, or depiction of the late 60s conflict is GIs in green walking through the jungle brush as Huey helicopters buzz over the tree canopies. Chaos surrounding as a Rolling Stones or other influential song from the era plays in the background. The camera pans out to show how thick the jungle is as the soldiers are always looking for someone named Charlie. Wonder if they found him. Forrest Gump jokes aside, good movie, go see it. Yes, that is the Vietnam War for the US, but there were actually a few other countries involved. More than you might think. The Soviet Union and China were 100% supporting 
Vietnamese communists. The French years prior were trying to claim back an old colony, and Australia also sent soldiers to support the effort. And perhaps most strangely, South Korea sent soldiers to aid South Vietnam, so the same thing didn't happen to them. It's just a crazy mix, isn't it? Number 9. Are you done? If you ever find yourself getting captured by spooky scary communists, maybe you should remember Doug Hegdel, a sailor who was blown overboard by a ship gun and washed ashore to probably the worst shore to wash up on in the 1960s. Maybe that or a nude beach full of hippies, I digress. Doug eventually found himself in a super friendly POW camp. Doug knew he was going to be in some trouble, and if he didn't think fast, was going to be subjected to torment that isn't appropriate for any YouTube or TV show on air. So what did Doug do? A daring escape, you say? Eliminated all his enemies from the stealth that only a cardboard box could provide? Hang upside down with tri-light night vision goggles and wait for guards to walk by? No, my stealth gaming friends, he played dumb. Very dumb, in order to convince the enemy that he wasn't worth very much, so that in theory they would let him go. Not convinced, the Viet Cong tried to get Doug to spew propaganda. Doug made a five head play and pretended he couldn't read. He pretended to be three head. After many efforts, the Viet Cong declared him the incredibly stupid one. He was eventually released back to the US where he gave some intel on the Viet Cong that he remembered over his time locked up, which he remembered to, to the tune of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. Doesn't get any more American than that. Oh, McDonald had a farm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway. Number eight, 360 all scope. Remember the days of Modern Warfare 2? Remember hitting those early spawn shots on high rise with the intervention? Yes, me too. Times have changed, and although the days of waking up early on Saturday morning to rip a little Call of Duty while well, your parents fight in the next room may be gone for me, they are not forgotten. I wasn't the best sniper out there, but I could hit a shot or two. However, no energy drink fueled YY ladder stall compares to the white feather. Meet Carlos Hathcock, a sharpshooter from the Vietnam War whose accuracy would have Robin Hood questioning his bowstrings. He is credited with taking down a lot of enemies from a quite a staggering distance away. However, his biggest claim to fame would be his Robin Hood splitting arrow moment. One day in the Vietnam jungle, he spotted an enemy sniper and terminated the threat. The thing is that Hathcock's bullet went through the enemy scope and ended his sniping career. That's one heck of a shot. Mom, get the camera! Number seven, tall courage. Richard Flaherty was unusual to most US soldiers deployed in Vietnam at the time. He was a short king, measuring in just short of five feet, which was the US requirement for soldiers at the time. His training proved that while he was short, he was just as effective as the other soldiers. Nicknamed the Mighty Mouse and the Giant Killer when in the field, his courage and efforts would see him join the famous 101st Airborne where he was sent on search and destroy missions in the thick jungle brush. His efforts would eventually earn him a silver star, and would wind up in the very tough yet mysterious Green Berets. Never judge a book by its cover. Number six, yeah, of course I am the American. Larry Thorne was a soldier and a great leader for US forces training civilians in Vietnam. Distinguished with medals and wasn't afraid to get dirty. He helped defend a base from a Vietnamese attack, and if he wasn't there, it most likely would have gone foobar. However, that's not what's so messed up about Mr. Thorne. Larry was hiding something, something rather interesting. Being a little bit older, it made sense that he had been in the military for a while. However, it wasn't the US Army. Larry had fought in two other armies previously. The Finland Army, which was his home against the Soviets in the Winter War, and more disturbingly, fought with the German Waffen SS. Yeah, I am an American and I have no prior actions that would cause you to have any suspicion. Yeah, sadly for the man with all that experience, he perished in a helicopter crash in 1965. His body was recovered years later and was given full military honors when buried. You never know who you're standing beside. Number five, welcome to the suck. Meet Roy Benavidez, a soldier with so much courage and bravery, I don't even have a joke for it. A man who after being severely injured and told he was never going to walk again, walked out of the hospital six months later. He then joined the very tough and elite Green Berets, where he went on a mission and was stuck in hell for six hours. A group of Green Berets, including himself, had been pinned down by enemy fire and it wasn't looking too good. Most of the group, unfortunately, was severely injured or simply just not living anymore. Roy himself had sustained bullet wounds and had been stabbed by an enemy bayonet. He eventually made it out barely alive, and when the doctors got to him, they said he wouldn't make it. So with his last breath of life, 
He spat in the doctor's face to show he was still somehow holding on. When you look at the full story, it's crazy. It's so messed up. I left a lot of the gruesome details out, but definitely check that one out. Number four, hideouts. Officials say the Vietnam War officially ended in 1975. Officially. However, for many, there was much fighting to do. For black Americans, the civil rights movement may have changed things, but there was still a long way to go. Vietnam had a communist utopia to unite and build, and many people simply had to recover from the casualties of war, injuries both physical and mental. However, for one father and son duo, this fighting lasted decades, literally. Ho Van Tan ran into the jungle with his one-year-old son in 1972 after his village was destroyed by American bombs in Operation Rolling Thunder. Fearful that it would be the end of him and his family, he hid from the war. He hid for 40 years and wouldn't come out of hiding until 2013, when he was in his 80s and his son was in his 40s. The men were frail, malnourished, and had severely rotten teeth. Can you imagine what it would be like to live without any technology for 40 years and then to come out of the jungle and find smartphones everywhere? It's just such a polarizing idea. Messed up, man. Messed up. Number three, high times in Vietnam, man. Peter Lemon was one of many soldiers in Vietnam whose efforts defending a US base with a machine gun and his bare hands earned him a medal of honor. Thing is, Peter Lemon wasn't a Yankee. He was a Canuck, born in Toronto. Becoming a Patriot American and joining the war was part of his dream for some reason. What's so messed up about Peter, you ask? It's not about being Canadian in the American Army and really just doing very well. We're cool, I promise. But rather, it's his illusions of him fighting the war that quickly deteriorated. If you were around in the 60s and 70s, you probably took part in a little thing called grass. To say it was everywhere was an understatement, but I mean, hey, these guys were at war. They needed a break. His defense of the US base, while under the influence of the devil's lettuce, is where this point is getting to. Number two, save the trees, man. Like I've mentioned before, the jungles of Vietnam were just as much as an enemy for the US soldiers as the communists were. Agent Orange was used to help unjungle the jungle, but it wasn't instant working and it took a few days to really kick in. Bulldozers were sent in after to help remove the trees. This for the US wasn't fast enough and they needed a better answer. So it was time to militarize some serious logging equipment. A 97 ton tree crusher that made trees 50 feet tall crumble like saplings. However, the machine was prone to breaking down and did get stuck in the mud. And in case you didn't know, towing a 97 ton vehicle out of the mud while being fired upon is not easy. No thank you, I'll pass. Number one, actually Apocalypse Now. Yes, the movie, go watch the movie, the original, not the Redux, you can, you can skip the Redux. Well, based on the book Heart of Darkness, the movie is based around the Vietnam War, but if you ask me, it does a better job of getting the themes across in a more digestible setting. You can take the movie in many different ways, but even at face value as a movie in the Vietnam War, it's insane. It does a great job of showing the horrors of war, the insanity, PTSD, hypocrisy, and the gore that was the Vietnam War. Vietnam War. A war that would leave America slightly embarrassed, as this was a time of great change all over the world. Couldn't recommend it enough though, seriously, go watch it. The horror. The horror. Number 10, not till the fat lady sings. Most people would be delighted to know that a war is over. War sucks, it's expensive, costs lives, and uh, come on man, it just sucks. Officially, North and South Korea have not signed a peace treaty. That's right. Although they both agreed to an armistice in 1953, on solid paper, there's no surrender, which technically means they're still at war. This sounds bad, but it can't be, right? Not as if tensions between these two could ever be high. It's not as if they're scheming of ways to undermine each other and just waiting for an excuse to open the biggest can of whoop ass at a minute's notice, right? Everything's fine. I don't know if everything's fine. Number nine. Up and down. The Korean War was a great military success and everyone went home happy. Very nice, great success. Uh, just kidding, actually. It didn't really solve anything. What's so messed up is everyone just kinda ended up where they started. North Korea had pushed into the south, almost making it all the way south, when the very effective UN organized a police force of multiple nations mostly US, and punch their way back up to the 38th parallel. But maybe we better go further, ballsy General MacArthur Douglas said to himself, admiring his own reflection in the mirror, pushing their way all the way up to the Chinese border where 250,000 Chinese soldiers helped the UN force by pushing them back down to the 38th parallel, putting everyone in the same position they were in the beginning. It's almost as if war was the pointless cost of life. Nah, that can't be right, no. Number 8. Nuclear Threequel 
This one is kind of scary, honestly. So, during the Korean War's impression of snakes and ladders, game of borders, and front lines changing like the wind, General MacArthur was getting frustrated with the progress, or lack thereof. He wanted a quick solution. Something that would bring a swift end to the conflict, all while flexing a little muscle in the process. Being a big fan of how the US annihilated two cities in Japan in the previous war, he proposed that America once again just start dropping nukes fallout style. While this was being considered, it was ultimately a no cal zone situation, as I like to call it, for the US and the UN. Soviet Russia had just figured out the recipe for nuclear bombs, and would not hesitate to send one their way in return. The US had lost its nuclear monopoly and ushered in the age of mutually assured destruction. And thank god they didn't to be honest. I love playing the Fallout games, but that doesn't mean I actually want to be in them. Not nah, thanks man, I, I'm good. I'm good dude. Number 7. I need a hero. When we all tell stories, we like to tell stories with heroes and villains, beginnings, middles, ends, rising actions, climax, and conclusion. Bad guy hurts good guy, good guy perseveres, and he beats bad guy. Credits roll as the hero walks off into the sunset. Now I'd like to tell you that the Korean War was a tale of good versus evil. But it's more like bad versus evil. Korea was split between communist north supported by China and the Soviet Union, the south was supported by the UN and the US. Each has their own dictator wanting to unify Korea in their own image. Yes, the communists were not very nice, but the right wing dictator installed by the US was arguably just as bad. So in short, a super awesome time to be in Korea. Number 6. Tootsie Slide this one goes out to all the fans of MacGyver, you're gonna love this one. So during a very cold segment of the Korean War known as the Chosen Mountain, nicknamed Frozen Chosen by the very cold marines that were stationed there, temperatures were below negative 25 degrees celsius and morale was lower, well actually their ammo count was. So the marines radioed in an airdrop for Tootsie Rolls, which was just a code name they'd given to mortar shells. Apparently the radio operator receiving this message did not understand this. And the actual chocolate candy Tootsie Roll was airdropped to the Marines instead. Yeah. Not wanting to waste this processed American delicacy, Americans went full MacGyver and discovered that once chewed and placed in bullet holes or in things that needed to be filled, the treat made for a decent enough repair. If women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. Number 5. Stranger Danger We all know if there's a van that rolls up to your neighborhood and there's a man inside offering free candy, it's gonna be a bad time. Well, North Korea might have had the biggest and baddest van in the neighborhood, as it's estimated that 84,000 people were kidnapped during the war. That is so many people. Why was North Korea putting so many faces on the side of milk cartons, you ask? Well, it was mainly a forced repopulation tactic, which again is so messed up, I can't even begin to tell you how wrong that is, but also may have been the beginning of a super secret spy program, where North Korea was interested in having biracial spies, making it easier to infiltrate infiltrate the enemy. Just one of many nefarious activities North Korea has been up to. There is no spy program in North Korea and I, I am not saying, I, I am absolutely saying this of my own free will. Please do not send help. Number 4. Not actually a war. While there were a lot of bang bang shooty shooty killy killy during the Korean war, technically it wasn't really a war even though it feels like one. Being referred to as a police matter, yeah. The US sent a lot of troops to fight this not war, which in case you're wondering how that's possible, you can take a look at Congress, as Congress never declared war, setting a new precedent. Although after the millions of dollars spent, the loss of thousands of soldiers on each side, plus the UN force being comprised of 16 other nations, I'm not exactly sure how it's not a war, that's like me saying, I did not do my English essay because it's not an English essay. It's a two page opinionated piece that should be four pages, but I didn't read the book and just use cliff notes. Sorry Mrs. M. I mean come on, can you blame me? Have you ever actually tried to sit down and read Lord of the Flies? Not in a school setting? I called the chief last night, you know what, he said it wasn't it. Number 3. Top Gun Ask any military history guru or anyone who's got a thing for it and they will tell you that after World War II, military tech was about to get a little crazy. On September 8th, 1950, something a little spicy happened in regards to both military and aviation history. The world's first all-jet dogfight took place. 
Americans and F-80s, and communists piloting the infamous MiG. Despite a movie that I actually think isn't very good, this wasn't great for the Americans. Yes, they did end up shooting down the enemy, but it was clear that the MiG was outperforming the F-80. Forced American aviation to come up with something just a little bit better. Come on guys, you can do it. Number 2. Just in case. So it's been years since the Korean War. They've been split in half. DMZ is there. Everything's kosher, right? Well, not exactly. If you follow the news in recent years, you know that North Korea has been doing some unsavory testing with ballistic missiles. However, what some people may not know, and it's kind of messed up when you think about it, is to this day there is still a large number of US soldiers stationed in South Korea. 30,000 to be exact. A remnant from the Korean War, but something that many would consider to be a necessity given the hostile nature of the North Korean regime. Hopefully things stay in a stalemate and don't escalate. We got enough problems on our hands right now. On a side note, there's also a large concentration of US soldiers in Japan as well. Not directly related to the Korean War, but they are in close proximity just in case uh, anything sneaky happens. Okay. Number 1. Big Boom Little Changes World War I changed lives. It dissolved century old empires, completely redrew the map. World War II doesn't happen without World War I, and it was so bad, the whole world swore to never let that happen again. Heck, even wars from centuries ago had more cause and effect. The Korean War is very different in this regard. Like previously mentioned, the communists were bad, but the capitalists were not much better. While the lines may not be as blurred as some wars, the outcome was completely different to what most people were used to. When World War II ended, there was cheering in the streets. When the Korean War ended, there just wasn't much to show for it, besides a tragic loss of life, debt, and a new theory about communism that would literally make the exact same thing happen in Vietnam 15 years later. Seriously, the comparisons are uncanny. It's like the exact same thing. Crazy. Number 10, Japanese holdouts. September 2nd, 1945, World War II had come to an end as the Japanese forces officially surrendered. Well, that's awesome, right? Time to go on vacation, honey. Say, those Pacific Islands look beautiful this time of year. Well, especially when we're not being shot at. They look a lot better then. Sounds great, right? I know. Well, I'd be careful where you go. As when night falls on the islands, you can never be too sure what lurks in the brush. That includes soldiers of the Japanese Empire still fighting World War II on their own terms. That's right, Japan went on the defensive after the Battle of Midway during World War II, occupying every island in the Pacific to slow down the Allies. Now, you mix in being dug into those islands for years with an unrelenting dedication to the Emperor, thank you very much, and you get yourself some soldiers who just won't quit. Years after World War II ended, a handful of dudes who had finally come to realize that it was all over finally surrendered. However, some soldiers stayed in hiding for up to almost 30 years. They thought they were fighting World War II for 30 years. That is insane. Number 9, Mad Jack Churchill. With the way Hollywood works, I'm more surprised this guy hasn't gotten a movie made about him. Seriously, look this guy up, you won't believe it. However, what I can say is I'm glad he was on our side, and I am very sure of that. Mad Jack Churchill was a British commando who was more known for his use of medieval tactics well, because he liked to use a longbow and a broadsword uh, for battle, which I, I can't even tell you how messed up that is. I can only imagine the fear in the German's eyes when a man cometh marching over a hill, playing Scotland the Brave, wielding a broadsword and charging at full speed. <sighs> Jack was captured, escaped, captured again, and after he and some other POWs dug their way to a prison, he then walked hundreds of miles to the Allies in Italy. That is a, that's just a crazy story. Where is that man's story? And coming over to the, you know, playing Scotland the Brave, that's crazy, man. That's insane. I, I like that, though, I like that song. That's a good song choice if I've ever heard that. Number eight, Desmond Doss. Besides having a name that really sounds cool, Desmond is a man with a unique experience. When you think of war, it's guy with gun go boom, right? Makes sense, sure. Well, not according to Desmond. He walked into battle as a combat medic without a firearm. Yes, nothing to defend himself with. I know, he's crazy, right? I know. Crazy enough to earn himself the Medal of Honor, which usually isn't earned whilst you're still alive. Usually earned after you, you don't make it. His valor was proven in Okinawa and Hacksaw Ridge, good movie, go see it, where he helped carry injured men back from the line and literally saved their lives. All while under the threat of enemy attack and sharpshooters. Over his life saving career, he would save up to 100 lives and a few more. He even saved some enemy lives. 
a shining light in pure darkness. Number 7, Second Son. Sutomo Yamaguchi is a very lucky man. Folks, after hearing about this one, I would go and buy a lottery ticket. Seriously. You may win after this, pretty lucky. Okay, so Mr. Yamaguchi was on a business trip in Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945. He was set to return to his home in Nagasaki when an American B-52 bomber dropped its payload on the city. And this was the big bad one. Miraculously, Mr. Yamaguchi, after being blown off his feet and receiving cuts and radiation burns, was still alive. He rested at a shelter and then returned home. On August 9th, he was explaining what had happened to him three days prior when another large flash of light and explosion went off. This was the other big one. It left him deaf in one ear, but he was further away from ground zero the second time. But yes, this is a man who survived both atomic devices. He lived all the way up until his 90s. Very impressive. Number six, escaping to South America. This is one of the reasons I have an issue with the Disney Star Wars movies. Hang in there, trust me. After Darth Vader destroys the Sith with the love of his son and the Emperor takes a dive into the exploding Death Star 2 reactor, oh no, not another dive in the reactor. Most people think it's all over, but what about the countless other Imperials, thousands of stormtroopers and star destroyers? For the Disney movie, they pretty much just updated the look and said, yeah, they're back, they're, they're back now. But I need more details, baby. Speaking of details, how did high-ranking Germans escape to South America after World War II ended? Hmm, yes, thought-provoking, isn't it? Well, that's right, they did. The answer, though, is a network of rat lines. Germany 1945 had an issue. If you look to your left, there was a coalition force of armies coming their way, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to Berlin. On their right, was an army bent on revenge singing a much more heinous version of Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to Berlin. So the Germans grabbed their schnitzel and sauerkraut to go and de-assed the area. Trouble is, the guys who were escaping were the worst of the worst. We weren't talking about any grandpas or opas here. These, these guys were pretty bad. Ones responsible for very horrible things. Some were caught, but sadly, others were not. Josef Mengele comes to mind. Google him. Not nice. Number 5, the Bataan March. The Bataan March is very similar to the beep test. Or imagine track and field in school, except instead of teachers forcing you to compete in events not designed around your body type, thanks, you're a soldier and the Imperial Japanese Army is making you march miles in the brutal sun. And some people with no shoes on, who often get berated and tormented. Okay, I guess the two aren't very similar at all, but you get the point. All you need to know is that some POWs took a very long walk and a lot of these POWs, for sure, were not supposed to be treated that way. It was, it was really bad, actually. Did not make it to the destination at all. MacArthur said he was coming back after this, and boy did he. Ooh, he came back with a vengeance. Number four, veterans. This one is a broad stroke, but I think it fits the bill here. Pretty accurately, actually. This goes out to all veterans of the Second World War. Folks at home, you might have to show them this because I can imagine they're a little bit older and probably not too familiar with YouTube, but thank you to all the men and women out there who did their part and paid a bill that I know I never could. The closest I ever want to be to a battlefield is, well, Battlefield or Call of Duty. From the campaigns in Africa, Italy, France, and pushing all the way into Germany as well as the brave fighting in the Pacific. I remember, and I for one am very thankful. You don't need to tell me how hard it was to survive or the fight when you came back home. A little a wholesome point there, I, I love that. You guys are great, thank you very much. Number three, Bob Hoover, the pilot's pilot. You gotta respect the style of Bob Hoover. Okay, so let's say you spend a year in a German POW camp. You made for your escape, except now what? If it's early 1940s like Bob Hoover found himself in, not a lot of Germanless areas uh, to be in. Well, Bob Hoover knew he needed to say Auf Wiedersehen and get the heck out of there. Bob Hoover did not walk, however. No, he did something much cooler. Kind of like when you hijack your first Banshee in Halo 3. Yeah, same thing and same feeling. Bob, being the excellent pilot he was, managed to steal a German plane and flew back to safety, where he linked up with some British allies in the area. How James Bond of you, sir. Oh, yes, I love it. Number two, Ivan Chizov. Another airplane story, but gosh darn, this one is uh, really impressive. Ivan Chizov was a Russian fighter pilot who was having some plane troubles. And by plane troubles, I mean it was going to crash. So yeah, not good. The man knew he had to eject, but the troublesome German planes around him, and the German planes being known for shooting at parachuters, well, he knew he had to make a five head play. He said, I'll just wait till I'm below the ensuing air battle, and then I'll pull my parachute. Well, 
Sadly, he waited too long and his chute didn't open. He fell 5,000 meters to the ground and lived. He lived. I, I, Poor Ivan did sustain some serious injuries, but like a miracle, got the medical attention he needed and asked to join back in the fight only three months later. That's just kind of crazy. 5,000 meters and he lived? How? Number one, German summer camp. I promise it's not going where you think it's going. The international community had an idea of what Germany was up to during the years before World War II, but no one really knew for sure. When Allies moved into occupied Europe, it was clear some people were gonna have some explaining to do, okay? They just can't do this, guy. Okay? Can't do that, man. Can't do that. But you guys knew that. It was awful and it should never happen again. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. However, today the worst camp I want to talk about is their youth program. Mustache Man was trying to build a better Germany. If he started with the youngins, the camp was designed like many today to give young folks something to do, to educate them, keep them occupied, or in my mom's case, uh, some peace and quiet during the summer. Well, this camp, it wasn't bonfires and swimming. It was all kinds of nasty things you two probably won't let me say. But what I can tell you is that it was a brainwashing effort to get everyone in support of their not so glorious leader. Number 10, Unsinkable Sam. Have you ever had a cat kind of look you up and down like expecting something? Like that, you know? Everyone has, why? Because cats are better than you. They were worshiped in Egypt for a reason. Cats can survive on the streets for days and then come back for cuddles when they want to. The tale of Unsinkable Sam is just another reason why cats are just ridiculous. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. He started out on a German warship called the Bismarck that he snuck aboard. That blew up along with 2200 men on board, but remarkably this cat was found by the HMS Cossack on a plank of wood. So the Brits took him and then their ship was attacked. Well Sam had to figure things out once again and this time the HMS Arc Royale found him chilling once again on some debris. Finally he earned the name of Unsinkable Sam. But it wasn't over for this little dude as a few months after that the Royale was torpedoed and Sam was saved again by the HMS Legion and by his sheer badassery. Finally they brought him ashore. <laughs> Poor guy. And this seafaring adventurer retired to land and later died in 1955. I don't know how well he recovered. <laughs> Check out this picture. Number nine, interrogations. Hans Scharf was living in South Africa with his family, but when he was visiting Germany, that's when the war broke out. He was drafted, but his wife convinced a general to not put him at the front lines, but instead with the interpreters. After a handful of pleasant mistakes and wild coincidences, Hans became the lead interrogator for the Allied pilots felled in France and Germany. His methods, though, changed history in a good way. When he was younger, he witnessed a prisoner get abused, so from that day on, he vowed to never do the same. So his interrogation methods revolved around using kindness and friendly banter. His method had been studied since, and it works even better, of course. This way, whoever's on the other side, they leak more information, and nobody has to break any fingers. Once the war was over, Scharf testified against Germans, moved to the States, and began a new career as a mosaic artist. His work is currently on display right now in Cinderella's castle at Disney World. So if you want to take a good look, go and buy a $90 ticket and look. Number eight, the limping lady. Her name, Virginia Hall. Permission to take down the Third Reich. Athletic, sharp, and funny, fluent in German, Italian, French, and a little Russian, Hall had all the makings to be a perfect spy. Born in Baltimore, Maryland to a wealthy family, she had no limits on where she would go, except for this. She applied to the US Foreign Service twice, and was denied both times, firstly because she was a woman, and the second time because she was a woman and a cripple. She had accidentally mangled her left foot and had replaced it with a wooden prosthetic, hence the later name, The Limping Lady. She moved to Paris, and one night at a cocktail bar, she was rallying against the evil German leader when a woman handed her a card. The woman was none other than Vera Atkins, a British spy master believed to be Ian Fleming's inspiration for Miss Moneypenny and James Bond. Throughout the war, Hall was dubbed the most dangerous spy on the Allied force by the Germans. They hated her. Through guerrilla tactics, expert stealth communication, and disguise, she quickly became a legend. After the war, Hall was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, one of the highest US military honors for bravery in combat. Take that, Secret Service. Number seven, Operation Gunnerside. This next one should be a movie. It's already a movie? Damn it. 
Okay, back in 1943, the Germans were up to some things. We can't say certain words because of YouTube's stuff, but you get me, they were busy. In the early 40s, Germany took over a factory in Telemark so they could make plutonium. Originally, the Allies sent 30 British Army officers, but they couldn't make it due to weather conditions. So next, they sent 11 Norwegians with skis. That's apparently all it takes to sabotage the plant. This is amazing, okay. The Norwegians snuck down a 660-foot ice gorge, snuck in, laid a bunch of explosives, waited for their hostage to find his glasses. He was a Norwegian caretaker. They let him go afterwards. Zero casualties in this entire mission, by the way. And then they left on skis. The one guy actually went back with his friends to sink a ferry. The Heroes of Telemark starring Kirk Douglas. Check it out if you want to see what I just said in action. Number six, the spy they didn't know they had. Another spy, but I spy spies. Not only did this dude fake his death for over 30 years, he was one of Britain's most crucial spies. He was so good, they didn't even know he was working for them. He was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War and loathed totalitarianism. He wanted to take dollar store Charlie Chaplin down. At the beginning of the war, Juan Pujol Garcia approached the British government about working as a spy against Germany for them. But he was rejected because he didn't have the credentials. So he just went ahead and did it anyway. On a flight from Madrid, he met some German officers and offered his services to spy against the British. They thought he lived in England. But the entire time, he was just living in Spain, feeding them false information. He just like pulled info from encyclopedias and advertisements to make them seem more legit. And he made mistakes like saying the Scots loved wine and the Germans still believed him. <laughs> exactly, Scots loving wine, no way. He invented over 27 informants and spies that he received information from, therefore making him kind of like invaluable. He eventually approached Britain again to apply for the job he was already doing. They of course hired him and were like, dude, what? What? Okay, sure. Garcia also played a key role in D-Day by telling the Germans the plan was fake, causing them to be unprepared for the day. After the war, he faked his own death until he was tracked down in the 1980s by a writer who was interested in telling his story and was like, I don't think this guy's dead, and then like went off and found him. That also should be a movie. Number five, Mad Jack. During World War II, you needed all the power you could get, but one man, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Churchill, AKA Mad Jack, had a different mindset when it came to battle and weaponry. He believed any British soldier going into battle without using a sword was improperly dressed. Also, fun fact about Mad Jack Churchill, he represented Great Britain in the World Archery Championships. So not only did he have a sword, but he also went into battle with a longbow, like he's Hawkeye. History has acknowledged Mad Jack as the last man to take out an enemy in combat with a longbow. That is a pretty wild achievement to have. But here's the most intimidating part about all of this, if for some reason you're still not impressed. Before combat, right before, Mad Jack would play the bagpipes before drawing his sword and running into battle. That is the most badass thing I've ever heard. Imagine hearing bagpipes just coming from afar and then just hearing arrows flying in. I'd give up, here's the white flag. You earned it, Mad Jack, see ya. Number four, bat bombs. This sounds fake, but it is indeed true. Apparently bombs, artillery, tanks, were no longer like the in way to decimate your enemies. A dude in the United States thought he had a batter idea. Bat bombs were an experimental weapon developed in World War II, which was exactly as it sounds. The idea was that bats with bombs attached to them would swoop in behind the enemy lines and decimate the enemy. Who was the genius behind this idea? A man by the name of Lytle S. Adams, and he was a dentist from Pennsylvania. The 60 year old tooth fairy was driving home from vacation when suddenly he was bombarded with brilliance. He witnessed thousands of bats exit the Carlsbad Caves and when he heard about Pearl Harbor, he began planning. These tiny flying mammals could be connected to tiny time fused incendiary bombs and then released to land on the enemy. Just two months after Pearl Harbor, he presented the idea to the White House along with his oddball team. A pilot turned actor, an ex-gangster, and an ex-hotel manager to name a few. The project was greenlit, however the project was abandoned in 1943 due to the development of nuclear bombs. Number three, reindeer on a sub. June 1941, the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union. It was one of the biggest attacks in history. And Britain and US had to send weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. They sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle. That was the only route, but of course it was littered with U-boats. 
Thankfully, the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn, the Soviets were able to fight on. So as a gift, as a thank you, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, the World War II submarine, a gift. They sent him a live reindeer, six foot, real life reindeer. And the British had to accept because it was ill-mannered if they didn't. So they had to keep a six foot tall real reindeer on a submarine, a World War II submarine. Not even like a bigger, nicer one, just a little underwater. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. She was a crew member for six weeks. She slept better than most as well. She actually shared a room in the captain's quarters. Imagine the smell. Mm. Finally, the Trident returned home to Britain and our leading lady was donated to the Regent's Park Zoo. All right, number two, the big dump. Like it or not, we've all been that person. The one to leave the bathroom a little more violent than you loved it. But I can't imagine anyone else in history of the world feeling more guilty than the one who sank a U-boat with his dump. That's right. Apparently it's not so easy relieving yourself miles below the ocean in a submarine. German U-boats had a two-valve system that only worked during shallow dives. But if you have a torpedo to drop of your own, time isn't always on your side. On April 14th, 1945, while 200 feet below, an unknown dumper caused a toilet malfunction, causing sewage and salt water to flood the compartment. The circuitry got fried, releasing chlorine gas, so they had to resurface. But when they did, they were spotted by the Brits and were attacked. Four of the crewmen died and the rest were captured, which I guess is how the story caught on. Imagine being the dude who dumped so hard he sunk a U-boat. And finally coming in at number one, Diamond Heist. Now most of these sound like movies, some of them are in fact already movies. This last one is absolutely insane. It should be a musical or something. It happened around May 1940 when Colonel Montague, nicknamed Monty, he was an undercover agent working for MI6. And when Germany was invading Amsterdam, he knew that big guns would eventually want to steal an extremely valuable amount of diamonds. So Monty, the quick thinker that he was, stole them first. You know, to keep him safe and to also look cool. He had gotten a key to the entrance of the Amsterdam diamond market, like literally he had a key, like it's Legend of Zelda, and then traveled to the building in regular human ordinary clothes, broke in, but he didn't know the code to the vault. He was looking back on past clues that he had acquired and he was working on getting in for about 24 hours straight. He literally heard Germans around the building and he got in the vault just in time. He completed his diamond heist, traveled all the way to England, and turned the diamonds over to the Dutch government, which is something I'm sure not all of us would do, so amen, Monty, killing it. Number 10, yikes at yeeps. Canadians, maple syrup, Tim Hortons, and for some reason, a lot of famous comedians. I don't know why we have a lot of comedians, but we do. That's right, you know them, you love them. What you may not know is that we, for some reason, possess the ability to be the most effective forces in combat. Who would know? You wouldn't think that for a bunch of nice plaid wear and hockey watch and beer enthusiasts. Our medal was tested in the First World War, which really showed the world that Canada was here to stay. However, this came at the cost of many young men's lives. The Second Battle of Yeep comes to mind, where the Germans first used chlorine gas as a chemical weapon, which in case you were wondering, was a huge no-no. I can only imagine the confusion and horror as yellow-green smoke crept its way across the field then to cause such horrible effects on the soldiers, who were reduced to urinating in handkerchiefs just to breathe. I talked to the chief last night. He just came in from Moose Job. I said that's not it. Number 9. Anglo-Franco Blood The Battle of the Somme was supposed to be a quick battle that would see a joint force of French and English soldiers pushing through the Somme River to break the German line of defense. There's really no such thing as a quick battle though, is there? A lot of the men were fresh and new and were eager to jump in only if they knew what awaited them. This list is going to be full of not so fun battles. The Somme was just that. The British suffered 58,000 casualties with over a third being deaths. You can imagine how the excitement and eagerness to be in a war quickly left the young man's hearts and began to fill with dread. Trench warfare was not a joke. Mixing the new and deadly weapons that made up the First World War with the old world strategies and tactics, and you've got a recipe for annihilation. No thank you, I will pass. Number eight, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. You probably know about this one, but man, it's kind of messed up. World War I was messy, it was costly, and it was paid in full by the men and women who lost their lives. America, while getting a very hard rap from the international community for joining the war very late, still put in a large effort into the First World War, and for that, lost many men to the cause. Like in all wars, after years of brutal fighting, the logistics can get a little muddy. Some soldiers' remains were simply just never found or identified. You can find these tombs all over the world, but perhaps it was the First World War that made it well known. And also perhaps the war to have the most unknown soldiers. 
Wherever you guys are, thank you for your service. Number seven, poor Germany. The number two bad guy in movies besides spooky scary Russians is Germans. And let's be honest, we had to fight them off twice. It left a bad taste in the international community's mouth. When we talk about World War II, we can say that Germans were 100% the villains of that story. That's just how it goes along with its imperial and fascist sidekicks, Italy and Japan. However, for the First World War, it's not so simple. While Germany was one of the main contributors of the destruction in the war, I don't think it's fair to completely blame them for the war. However, history is written by the victors, and Germany didn't win that one. And that's what's kind of messed up, is the Treaty of Versailles, which made Germany pay back an absurd amount of money in reparations, almost an imaginary number, especially right after a war. It also saw them demilitarize the Rhineland and give some crucial land and strategic resources like the industrial goods and power of the Ruhr Valley. Germany got wrecked in a nutshell. This made Germany go through hard times, harder than most other countries at the time, and was a main contributor in the rise of fascism in history's favorite mustache man. Number six, failed art student. Speaking of a super evil dictator mustache man, he was a soldier in World War I. After spending his years as a mediocre artist at best, painting paintings and postcards for whatever little money he could. People say his artwork is good, but I think it sucks and his proportions are off, nerd. Anyway, when the Great War broke out, he and many other young men felt inspired. The patriotism was alive and well. He regarded this time in his life in the trenches with his comrades to be some of the best. However, there was an incident where Mustache Man was in the sights of a British soldier, who with a swift pull of a trigger could have put Mustache Man down for good. However, he showed mercy and let him live, which later was probably a really awkward moment considering the events of World War II. This event is somewhat debated, and honestly, regardless of if he made it out to World War II or not, it was probably still going to happen. So, kind of a missed chance, I guess. Number five, oh Canada. The most defining moment for Canadians of the war was Vimy Ridge, a very costly battle that not only cost many Canadians their lives, but also many other armies trying to take it. Some people like to point out that America became a country during its war for independence. Well, Canada found its national identity in the battlefields of France. All Canadian regiments were put together for the assault. Men from all across the country together in a moment of glorious pride. One general is quoted as saying, in those few moments I saw the birth of a nation. As glorious as it was, this was World War I, which means the fighting was brutal, fighting that I know I could not do. So thank you gentlemen. There at Vimy Ridge stands a large monument to the grim day that Canada's identity was born. Number 4, Last Minute Valor. The war to end all wars was to end on the 11th month of the 11th day of the 11th hour, as an armistice had been signed, ending the horrible conflict that had cost millions of lives and had enough destruction to resemble the apocalypse. However, until 11 a.m., things were still on and some violence was still commenced. Probably the most ironic moment in human history was the death of Henry Gunther. Gunther hadn't had the prestigious military career he was looking for. Just minutes before the treaty would have gone into an effect everywhere, Gunther spotted a German roadblock position with a machine gun, and looking for a last second of glory, rushed the position with his bayonet against the wishes of his comrades. And the Germans who were waving with arms, pleading with him to stop. As he got closer and closer, the Germans had no choice but to cut him down with machine gun fire. The time was 10.59, one minute, 60 seconds before it was all over, and he lost it all just for an ounce of glory. War is hell, man. Number three, the Ottoman War. Not something that's often talked about is the other fronts of the war. Yes, it would be impossible to talk about World War I without talking about the trenches in Europe, but this was a world war and spanned many different countries and biomes. Something that I think gets looked over a lot is the British involvement with the Ottomans in the deserts of the Middle East. Also the Anzac forces at Gallipoli. Shout out to my friends down under, how are you? But this is just a theater of war that doesn't get a lot of attention, even though it should be considering the Ottomans lost their empire after the war was over. The war changed lines on maps everywhere, all over the globe, and set the stage for not only World War II, but politics for the rest of the 20th century. Number two, mistakes were made. Okay, this wasn't exactly something that happened on the battlefields of the First World War, but it happened in 1917, and it was directly related to the war, the Halifax Explosion. 
If you know, you know. When the French cargo ship, the SS Mont Blanc, collided with another ship in the Halifax Harbor, a fire had started. The ship's cargo, unfortunately, was high explosives. A lot of them. The fire eventually detonated the explosives, and the chaos that followed was astronomical. It destroyed that district of the city, with almost 2,000 civilians perishing in the explosion. It was the largest man-made explosion until the detonation of the nuclear bombs in World War II. This is why there's a thousand rules for carrying dangerous or harmful materials. Mind you, I don't think you guys are delivering those kind of contents these days, but if you are, that's kind of cool. Number one, the League of Losers. Okay, so the war comes to an end, and although the first party contributors to the war have stopped fighting, there's still a lot of turmoil in Europe, especially in the East and the Balkans. When sitting down at the negotiation table, three things happened. One, they said that was bad. Wars cost a lot of lives. Number two, with the use of modern technology and knowledge from that war, we as the most powerful nation should band together to form a global committee to make sure that doesn't happen again. And number three, you suck Germany, this is all your fault, give us your money. Stupid idea. The League of Nations was created as a beta version of the UN, except the rules suck more than they do now. And America, one of the founding members and the ones proposing all this anti-war ideas, did not join. What? Which sure, they were basically forced into the war in the first place, but come on, it soon fell apart and, and you know what came next. World War, World War II came next, it was pretty bad. It was a bad sequel. Number 10, Crying Wolf. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was a conflict between Vietnam and US forces in 1964. What's messed up about that is that two days later, it happened again. Actually, it didn't. Big prank. The second incident was fabricated by the US just to justify ramping up their presence in Vietnam. Sadly, it worked, as the next eight years in Vietnam would end up being a total snipe storm for the US, as they would encounter problems abroad and at home. Thank goodness this is the only time the American government would ever lie about anything ever again, right? This was officially declassified decades later. Number 9, Agent Orange. The world agreed not to use chemical warfare after the First World War, as it was extremely cruel and lethal. So, you might be surprised that America used chemical weapons during the Vietnam War. Agent Orange, brought to you by the Dow Chemical Company, was a herbicide and defoliant dropped and sprayed from air vehicles to cut down the thick jungle brush. Viet Cong soldiers were excellent at living off the land and concealing themselves in the jungle. Bad guy hides in jungle, you remove the jungle. Makes sense. The chemical was extremely effective, but what's so messed up was the negative health side effects. Soldiers that were exposed to the chemical developed cancers years after the war. But what's even more crazy is how it affected the Vietnamese people. It created children with really bad health defects, and to this day there are many people who live with ill side effects of Agent Orange. That's just not right, man. That's wrong. That is so wrong, dude. Number 8. French Indochina the US was not the first superpower trying to tame Vietnam. Vietnam used to be called French Indochina, and it used to be a colony of France. And when they no longer wanted to be a part of that, France came down to give them a piece of their minds. But you can probably guess how that went considering the US was there 20 years later trying to do the same thing. While France was trying to keep a colony, and the US was trying to stop communism from spreading to other countries, Vietnam was trying to fight for its independence. Which is ironic for America because that's how they became a country. And yes, I know that the communist movement in Vietnam wasn't great by any standards, but the regime America was trying to put in place was no better. As much as France would have liked to keep Vietnam, Times were changing, and there was no victory in sight, with or without American support. Number 7. Well, that escalated quickly. Up until 1967, the war was bad. But it was nothing compared to what was going to happen in 1968. In 1968, the Viet Cong launched the Tet Offensive, a massive military campaign designed to destroy the foreign invaders. All across the country, key targets were being attacked, and it seemed overnight that the war went from a 6 all the way to an 11. What's so messed up though is even though the VC did not achieve major victories, it was costing a lot of American lives. With the Viet Cong using the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the war not only escalated in Vietnam, but had reached neighboring nations like Cambodia. This had an effect on the war back home. The US thought and told people it would be a quick war. They had the advantage. But after the VC flexing their military might, it was clear that more US soldiers would be needed to win the war. Which some people were beginning to question in the first place. And as time went on, most people would protest America's involvement. Number 6. A Terrible Loss of Life 
The Vietnam War is one of the most important events in US history, and honestly world history too. It was a very hot war during the Cold War, which we could do a whole video on that itself. A time of superpowers ready to annihilate one another at the push of a red button. Thousands of young men volunteered or were drafted to fight in a war that would humble the very powerful country. 58,141 Americans would lose their lives in order to contain communism. Of that 61%, they were under the age of 21. That is an insane, I can't even believe that. The Vietnamese lost over 300,000 people in the conflict. The war is remembered for being a tragic loss of life, and the domino theory that communism would spread throughout the world if containment was not initiated didn't happen, as most countries today just aren't communist. Number 5. Civil Rights If you know the 1960s, then you know it was a decade of change. A lot of history to unfold in just 10 years. Again, we could probably do a whole video on that. The Vietnam War is especially important towards the civil rights movement, as black Americans were a big part of the war effort in Vietnam. Black soldiers were nothing new to the American military, but their integration with white soldiers was. Every war previous, soldiers of different skin color were separated into different units. While most soldiers got along, there was still a long way to go, as black soldiers were still often mistreated. It seemed, however, that in a war zone, white Americans and black Americans were fine, but at home, had tensions. We could do a whole video on civil rights and segregation, but to sum it up, racial relations made Americans ask questions. And for black Americans, the question is, how is someone expected to fight a war in a foreign country that we really have no business being in for a country that won't allow a certain group of citizens to even buy a cup of coffee because they're not allowed to enter the building due to the color of their skin? Just doesn't make sense, man. Number 4. Mattel 16 The 1960s saw a lot of technological development. The extensive use of the helicopter comes to mind. During the early years of the Vietnam War, Americans were issued a brand new rifle. The M16 was a brand new design that flopped as hard as it could, as it tended not to work. Which, if you're in a war, is kind of not what you want to happen. Your stuff's kind of gotta work. A rumor had spread around that the firearm never needed to be cleaned, which in a jungle setting with mud and rain just doesn't make any sense. This, with already existing flaws, made it jam and was rendered useless by soldiers. Nicknamed the Mattel 16 after the toy company, some soldiers were forced to use enemy weapons, which sadly in some cases may have led to fatal incidents of friendly fire. Number 3. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Another very useful tool in destroying the Vietnamese jungle, trees are made of wood, and wood burns, so set them ablaze. Except napalm is different. A chemical compound meant to burn at a very hot temperature of 5000 degrees Fahrenheit, and it would burn for a while. This was used in multiple ways, but probably the most effective with airstrikes. While not the first time firebombing had been used, as it was proven effective in the firebombing of Japan during World War II, the Vietnam War saw almost the same amount of ordnance dropped, napalm and others included, as used in all of World War II by America. That is an insane statistic. It had a terrible effect on people, as it can burn skin off. The most infamous picture from the Vietnam War had something to do with this. We can't show it to you, but you've probably honestly seen it already. The military would later disband its use, as the ability to control napalm's destructive power is limited. Number 2. GI Kebab While the Viet Cong may not have won many battles against the US, they were still formidable fighters. They had the lay of the land and laid traps everywhere. From 1965 to 1970, 11% of American casualties were related to Viet Cong placed traps. What's so messed up in that is that in a modern war with modern technology, a lot of the traps the Viet Cong were using were something out of the Stone Age, but still deadly. Improvised explosives, swinging spike balls, trip wires, single shot cartridges, and snake pits right out of Indiana Jones. I can't even believe that's real. But the most effective were punji pits or punji sticks. A large hole is dug and bamboo spikes are placed at the bottom. Then, out of pure evil, urine or human excrement is put on the spikes. A thin layer of leaves or cover is placed on the trap, so when someone comes along they would fall in a pit of spikes that if that didn't kill them, an infection from the waste would, or make recovery very, very miserable. That is just, that is cruel, man. That is, that ain't right, man. That ain't right, Chief. Number one, Apocalypse Now. Tiger Force was a long range reconnaissance unit that later became known for its acts of war crimes. Not sure if there could be war crimes when everyone's doing naughty things, but 
okay. To quote Martin Sheen in Apocalypse Now, charging someone with murder around here is like handing out speeding tickets at the Indy 500. And like a scene right out of that movie, the members of Tiger Force had a tradition to make necklaces out of ears. I'm going to say that again. They made necklaces out of ears. There are a number of things Tiger Force committed that are honestly just not safe for life. But that's war at the end of the day. War as hell. Drew. Kicking off the list at number 10, A Day in the Life. So as soon as the sun came up, your life as a Civil War soldier began. You would train day in, day out, preparing for battle. It was important that each soldier knew their role to work together as a unit. Now, I would say that there's no time for fun and games, but they always made time to blow some steam off. In between drills, soldiers would do chores just like we do every day. They would cook meals, do laundry, clean gear, and make sure that everything is smooth. Passing the time was done by playing dominoes or poker. Reading was of course a popular way of passing the time as well, but it was a lot harder to get your hands on a book back then, especially when you're running around between marches and battles. So more often than not, soldiers would trade newspapers with their opponents. You would hear about the Christmas peace treaty, but this would happen as well, they would just trade Papers. A soldier named Milton Barrett, stationed in the 18th Georgia Volunteers, wrote about this back in 1863. He said, Our regiment had just come off picket. We stood close together and could talk to each other. Then when the officers were not present, we exchanged papers and bartered tobacco for coffee. They would do it when the officers weren't looking. That's the most intriguing part. They would manage this by using a small boat. Tricky, always away. The first aerial photograph was back in 1860. James Wallace Black took this photo, not by using drones or any bowling alley crazy technology we have today, but rather just a hot air balloon. This lovely landscape is the town of Boston and you're looking at it from 2,000 feet. This was a long time before selfie sticks. Even longer before that, hot air balloons were being used in warfare. The first account of a hot air balloon being used was 19... The first account of a hot air balloon being used in war was 1794, when the French Committee of Public Safety created the Corps d'Astrosiers, which is a hot air balloon squad. They were used in the Battle of Charleroi and Fleurus, and then 70 years later, they were used in the American Civil War. They were pretty large as well, they could fit around five guys, where smaller balloons like the Eagle and Excelsior only carried one soldier. Those were for stealth flights. That'd be pretty brave. Imagine seeing a hot air balloon coming over the horizon and it has soldiers shooting at you. That's incredible. I, I didn't hear about any of this growing up. They could reach up to a thousand feet, so they definitely had a vantage point like no other, and they would communicate with soldiers on the ground using flag signals or, of course, telegraphs. The most successful balloon program in the Union was under the command of Thaddeus Lowe. He and Lincoln were allies, and Lowe actually sent a telegraph to Lincoln once describing the view of Washington from above. Call your friends more and describe your view to them. You might get a few things done. Number eight, bounty jumpers. Fewer than 150 Union soldiers were killed for desertion, and Lincoln was actually constantly writing letters and endorsements reducing soldier sentences from death to labor during the war. That's how bad it got. Deserters were a big problem for both the Confederate and Union armies, so it was punishable by death. After the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Union had 100 deserters roughly a day. That's a lot, every single day. The Union actually used peer pressure at one point just to keep soldiers from leaving. In 1863, the Union offered regiment perks if a certain percentage of original men were on for a following tour of duty. So soldiers inside were making others stay on board. How they did that, what they said, we don't know. Bounty jumpers were men who were paid to fill on the spot of newly drafted soldiers. So these guys would join for a few days and then desert them all over again and join a new post as the new substitute and get paid. Of course, some deserters were branded to avoid this problem. Number seven, daily diet. These soldiers were all around 25 years old. The minimum age to join, of course, was 18, but a lot of these guys who were that young would often lie about their age anyways on paper. So on paper, the average was 25 years. But these guys were kids, basically. They ate mostly crackers. And when I say crackers, I don't mean the salty work snacks that you have today. These were made of like flour and water and just salt called hardtack. They would eat berries, nuts, and fruits, anything they could find is all they had. Most of these soldiers were close to starving to death. Number six, soldiers protest. One third of the Union soldiers were immigrants, and one in 10 were African American. And those soldiers actually refused their salaries for 18 months to protest being paid lower wages than white soldiers. When black soldiers were signing up in the Union Army in 1863, they were only getting $10 a month, while white soldiers were getting around $13 a month. Officers were getting $700 a month too. It was just insane. To make things even worse, black soldiers were then hit with a $3 monthly cleaning fee, bringing that down to $7 a month now. So a protest was in order and it was held for 18 months, and then come September 1864, black soldiers received equal pay that was retroactive to their enlistment date. So they finally were able to send money back to their families after that long. Number five, passing time. 
You would assume the civil war and being part of it and everything I've talked about would give you enough anxiety, but gambling was also a common pastime in between battles. And when I say gambling, I don't mean, okay, it's nighttime, let's throw a few bucks down and play dominoes. No, they would gamble on everything. Horse races, chess, euchre, poker, checkers, cards were popular until the end of the Civil War when of course they were harder to come by, being so flimsy and all. And when dominoes and cards were out of the picture, soldiers would really go old school and play leapfrog. Yeah, games like that were literally all they had. They would wrestle each other for fun, they would have foot races and bet on them. Bowling would be played using cannonballs to knock down wooden pins. And baseball was also played, but it was a little different back then to how we remember it now. The ball was a lot softer and there was sometimes only two bases. The only way you were out also was if you were hit by the ball. Hence the softness that I mentioned. Number four, coldest winters. With the winter winds rolling in occasionally, soldiers could no longer play baseball outside and peg each other with baseballs, but what you could do was hit each other with snowballs. A little fun, also a little scary. They called it a snow battle. Yeah, a snow battle too. Battle, way more intense. Soldiers would leave with bruises, black eyes, and sometimes even broken bones. Yeah, these guys were blowing off lots of steam and they would plan attacks and take it obviously seriously, as they did with their daily civil duties. Even officers got in on this action. When pieces of ice were no longer available to large units to throw at one's head, other winter games would include skating and sledding. Number three. Food march. In April 1863, a group of mostly women led a march to get the governor's attention. The governor at the time, John Letcher, was joined by President Jefferson Davis. It did not end well. The food situation in the South was not great because food prices changed depending on the status of the war. Outcomes of the battle directly affected prices because they were linked to the CSA's currency. That plus the fact that invading troops from the North would often burn crops when they came through, it was getting worse over time. Come April 1863, this march of women broke windows. They flipped carts until eventually they drew out Governor John Letcher and President Jefferson Davis. John Letcher literally started to throw cash at the protesters. Now, they still didn't stop, obviously, that didn't solve problems. It was so bad that the militia almost had to open fire. Number two, the alligator. I mentioned soldiers and hot air balloons, so I must mention the United States Navy's first submarine. Have fun. This 47 foot long submarine that was paddle powered, yep, you heard me, paddle powered, so you'd be inside and just, you would do this. We can't call it the USS Alligator because they technically didn't see any active days of combat. In fact, the Alligator, that's what I'll call it, had to be cut loose on its first mission. It was being towed behind the USS Sumter on April 2nd, 1863, right off North Carolina when bad weather hit. The Alligator went down and we haven't found it since. It's still out there. The Alligator is still lurking out there. Only a few months after this new weapon went down, the Confederate States of America launched their own sub, the H.L. Huntley, and it sank the USS Housatonic near the coast of Charleston, officially marking the first time a submarine sank an enemy ship. It also immediately sank afterwards, taking the lives of eight crewmen. So even in victory, you're not safe. They made history, but only enjoyed it for minutes. This is all tragic. Number one. The wage gap. Hundreds of women joined the Civil War and they did so by looking like men. Yeah, they would pull a she's the man and get to work. But the thing is, like I mentioned before, with the CSA's currency being affected by the status of the war, soldiers were getting $13 a month roughly. That's double what a woman could make anywhere on the planet, so they really had no choice but to join. This was long before women's suffrage, so if they thought you were a man, you could use that $13 how you wanted. So it comes to no surprise that women would keep this disguise even after the war ended. In 1909, the US Army officially denied that any woman was ever enlisted in the military service of the United States as a member of any organization of the regular or volunteer army at any time during the period of the Civil War. During the Civil War though, that was the first time in American history when women all came together in a war effort. Thousands of women from the North and South volunteered as nurses.